You know, I'm sometimes asked, why do you call your podcast the Locofoco Netcast? And they're not even concerned about the Netcast thing. They're wondering, what's this Locofoco business? And that's a good question, a fair question, and I should answer the question. And I could answer it directly, but I think I'm going to do it indirectly. First, I'm going to show you two books, one quite direct. This, this book is Fitzwilliam Birdsall's History of the Locofoco. That book explains really pretty well why I would call this a Locofoco. Why well, I have domain names like locofoco.net and locofoco.us. But let's go a little bit more indirect at it. Let's look at this book, Price Theory by David Friedman. Excellent book. Now, somewhere in this book, he tells a number of economics jokes. And one of these I related to Dr. Anthony Comegna, who is our guest today. And uh, we, we laughed about it. And the joke goes something like this. An Austrian economist and a neoclassical economist are walking down the street. And the Austrian says, look, they're on the sidewalk. There's a $20 bill. And the neoclassical economist doesn't even look. He just walks briskly by. It can't be there. Someone would have picked it up. Now you're wondering, why is that a joke? Well, maybe you should learn some economics. It's kind of funny. It's about equilibrium theory. But uh, I told it to Anthony Comegna because 30 years ago, I found some free money on the road. That is, I found a bit of history that no one knows anything about. I mean, back then, almost nobody knew anything about the Locofocos. So I began calling myself a Locofoco. Maybe partly to annoy my friends, but partly because it's a really important bit of history. But I just sort of let it there as a lark. I didn't do much with it. Dr. Anthony Comegna did something with it. So, this is the uh, Locofoco Netcast, number six. And we are going to talk to Dr. Anthony Comegna, and I'm going to ask him the burning question, what does the normal person need to know about the Locofoco? I would say that, of course, they need to know everything, because it's, t it's so terribly important. And what's even more than that, it's so understudied. So few people, you know, I'm I'm kind of dying to know uh, how you came across them because it, I, I just happened to chance across them in I think it was 2008 at Mises University. I was walking through the library in between sessions there, and I just stumbled across. Uh, I was looking for a subject to write my senior honors thesis on as an undergrad. I, you know, we had to do this little research project which is equivalent to sort of a half master's thesis, you know, for, for undergrads to get a feel for research. And I just happened, I was looking for a subject. I love Jacksonian America. That's what I wanted to specialize in. And I found Lawrence White's book on the shelf. Uh, his his um, re, republication is called Democratic Editorials. You can find it through Liberty Fund. And uh, it's a republication of some of the best editorials by a man named William Leggett, who was a Jacksonian-era uh, newspaper editor for, um, among several smaller papers of his own, uh, the New York Evening Post, which was oddly enough founded by Alexander Hamilton. And um, for, for the first generation or so, it was a Federalist paper until William Cullen Bryant, the the famous poet and uh, Democratic uh, uh, operative in some respects, uh, purchased it. And he put Leggett in as the editorial uh, writer. And he, he was just this amazing figure who was so radical for, for not only his day, but for any day. He was so wildly radical. I mean, it was things like private coinage, which was unheard of as, a, as even a suggestion in the, in the era. And Leggett was you know, so far ahead, almost 200 years ahead of something like Bitcoin in suggesting the different ways that we could have private coinage. And Congress does not need to set the value of money, just like they don't need to set the definition of words. I mean, it was it was just this, this small volume by Larry White was just an amazing entree to so many of the topics in Jacksonian America I thought were uh, understudied. And and misunderstood by mainstream historians. So this is not a field where historians have, have just, you know, not looked into it very much. Jacksonian America has, has an immense literature surrounding it uh, for, for over 100 years now. And it's simply that, as I found, historians just don't care. They find these people weird, 
and and you know impenetrable. They're they they sound like modern gold bugs and militia people to mainstream historians. You know, just just these weird impenetrable relics of a bygone era. And and here I was reading Leggett and thinking, my God, this guy is saying everything that that is animating me right now is, you know, 2008, a young person involved in the Ron Paul campaign. I spent over a week in New Hampshire. I mean, I was hooked, addicted to to all things Ron Paul. And, you know, these were my formative years. And it was just kismet that, that I discovered this book on the shelf. And I thought someone has to write more about this guy because I, I had seen him maybe in one stray footnote in one book I'd read as an undergrad, and that was it. And and I'd heard this word loco foco didn't register with me as anything because nobody wrote much about it. And I quickly discovered you'll find them mentioned in footnotes here and there. And you might have an index mention where there's one page where they're mentioned in the entire book. And I so I just thought, all right, I, I have to know more. I have to do this. I wrote my undergraduate honors thesis on William Blaggett. It was sort of an intellectual biography of him. And uh, that ended up becoming the first chapter in my dissertation from the University of Pittsburgh, where uh, I, like Murray Rothbard, I say I'm the world's expert on the loco focos because nobody else has written a book on it. That's, that's what he used to say about him in the Panic of 1819. Exactly. That's perfect. Uh, <laughs> so I, I took that as, frankly, a little bit of inspiration to to pick a, a dissertation that was really something that nobody had had tried to do before, I think. Largely because, like I said, it's not that I was some intrepid original, uh, you know, research entrepreneur, but mainstream historians just simply don't care. That's about right. I'm pretty sure I found it in a footnote, maybe mm. through the Liberty Fund publication of the Democratic mm. Editorials. I'm not sure. Um, I've never read all of the, that book. I've never read every word of Leggett. Uh, I don't know why it just, you know, I've have other, you know, I have other interests basically, I guess, but I just love the loco focos and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the, that's the book I got. I got, I believe this was sold at Barnes and Noble. Ah. I believe they sold <laughs> Birdsall's book at Barnes and Noble. And that's, that's, the, that's shocking. So that's, that's, that's the origin of, for, of it for me. And probably in 87, I probably knew about it in 87. So it's a long mm. time ago. Mm. Now, most people are wondering why loco foco. I mean, I have friends who say, what? what? Uh, it sounds silly. So you better tell the story of loco foco. Sure. So, so the loco foco started, like I said, with William Leggett and he was sort of their intellectual generation. This is a, a small group of people that started in, in New York city. And the thing about them that's really special is they were, they were more radical than the Jacksonians. Um, which is that they took what we understand as Jacksonian principles of democracy and republicanism and small government, limited government, free trade, and they extended it all the way, all the way across and all the way down. So every topic and as far as it can go, they wanted to push those principles. But that, of course, was too much for the rank and file Jacksonian. Uh, it, certainly, it was too much for the slaveholding planter president uh, who who controlled this budding party. And that's another important thing to remember here. There, there was really no Democratic Party as such until 1840. And in the 1830s, the, the political situation is much more amorphous, and it was very tied to Jackson as a personal figure. And then the anti-Jacksonians arrayed themselves against him and started calling themselves the Whigs by the 1836 uh, election. Now, in New York, what the the kicked off what we know uh, uh, as loco focoism was really Jackson's bank war was successful, and the loco focos wanted to extend that all the way down. Jackson famously made war on the second bank of the United States. He thought it was unconstitutional and it was harmful to uh, the economy, it caused the business cycle, and so he wanted to shut it down. Well, the, the radicals in, in New York around William Leggett said, why not extend that principle to state banks? There were all these state incorporated banks, too, that enjoyed special powers and privileges that distorted markets, inflated the currency, and in fact, the national bank put some sort of conservative check on the ability of state banks to issue excess reserves, you know? So you have this national bank actually func functioning to limit the amount of paper that state banks are able to issue, 
Well, it so happened that a lot of Jacksonian Democrats were in charge of those state banks and didn't want to give up their power to inflate the currency and control the bonanza in speculation that came from that and all of the political you know, perquisites that were attached to uh, manipulating markets. So they thought these radicals are asking for far too much. The National Bank, that killing that is good because it allows us, Democrats, Jacksonians, in control of state banks to inflate to our heart's desire. And this included pro-slavery people too. Slaveholders were always trying to manipulate the credit system because they took loans to purchase more slaves to plant more cotton to you know sell to emerging markets and they made a bonanza on uh, speculation in credit markets too so jackson was very very concerned with the ability of state banks uh, like alabama for example was a fully monopol state monopolized banking system this is one thing rothbard talks about in the panic of 1819 and it operated entirely for the planter class to get their slaves at, at cheaper prices to have constant credit. Anyways, the uh, radicals in New York said we have to extend this down to the state level. Um, and it really got kicked off actually because of a, uh, a, a, a an activity that the New York Anti-Slavery Society engaged in where it was the first direct mails campaign in 1835. And it just ha happened to be at this moment where the radicals are, are talking about the bank war and the inconsistency of the administration with that principle. And the New York Anti-Slavery Society prints up all these anti-slavery pamphlets and they mail them in huge numbers to Charleston, just to your average Southern citizen in Charleston. And when uh, Charlestonians get word of all these sacks of abolitionist mail sitting in their post office in downtown Charleston, they form up into a mob and they storm the post office, they, they bust in, grab the mail, take it out to the town square and burn it. And and the postmaster, uh, a man named uh, Alfred Huger, just looks the other way and, and he says, well, hey, look, there's there's nothing I'm going to do about this. He's he's caught between conflicting obligations, right? He's got to deliver the federal mails, but this mob is not going to let him. So he, he goes the pro-slavery route and, and lets them burn the mail. Jackson's postmaster general, Amos Kendall, who also happened to be the lead author of the, the famous bank veto, he also looks the other way and, and says, I'm not going to uh, uh, decry the mob here either. So de facto, the administration is in favor of this censorship, pro-slavery censorship of the federal mails. William Leggett reads this and he thinks, this is the government, just like in the bank question, using their monopoly, their legal control over the mails to favor a particular class of people over another. And those anti-slavery activists have just as much right to use the federal mails as any planter in the South, and you can't restrict who they're going to send things to. If, if the recipients want to burn it themselves, that's fine. But this is a clear use of government power to restrict the rights of a minority, and it is wrong. And uh, that was something the Democratic Party could not abide. So all this radical stuff on free trade was one thing, but they absolutely could not abide his extending those economic arguments to uh, across the color line to criticize slavery. So they officially read him out of the party. He called it his excommunication. They In the Washington Globe, the official outlet of the Democratic Party, they, they kicked him out of, uh, of association with, with all Jackson men. And... So the, the anti-slavery people sent him everything they had, and he just like took a few months off and read everything he could on anti-slavery, and he came out of it one of the most radical anti-slavery thinkers in the country, more radical than William Lloyd Garrison because Leggett said, "Let's look, turns out this union is evil, and we need to break it apart. It's better to break it apart. Uh, he said he'd rather see it be hewed to pieces limb by limb then prostituted out for the sake of a, a planter aristocracy. So anyway, but, but Garrison is yeah. famous for saying no union with slaveholders. So he he eventually came to that position, but it was a few years after William Leggett. I didn't realize that. Oh, that's fascinating. Yes. I think it was by 1839 Garrison was saying that Leggett was was arguing this in 37. 
Back in 1835, right after this males controversy, Leggett emerges as an abolitionist, and he and his radicals in New York City decide, you know what, there, there's no possibility of working within the Democratic Party to change the way that it works and make it a real anti-monopoly party. Uh, they prove that on the bank question, they prove that on the slavery question and censorship of the males. So here's what we're going to do. They plot in secret. They conspire, literally, uh, a secret conspiracy to take over the upcoming nominating conventions at Tammany Hall, the, the stronghold of the local Democratic Party. They're going to take over these nominating conventions, storm them with their surprise numbers. And, you know, normally these are supposed to be very tame affairs where the party tells you who to vote for and you raise your hand and nominate them and, and it all goes through. Well, they were going to totally upend this process. They, they had some understanding that Tammany would play dirty tricks on them, and so they came prepared with these friction matches that had just been invented only recently in the past decade. Um, and these are the matches that we're all familiar with today. Uh, they were called loco focos, and the, these is sort of an American bastardization of the Italian words for moving fire or fire in motion. Um, they put their, their pockets full of matches, and uh, they, they storm this nominating convention, cram Tammany Hall full of radical anti-monopolists, uh, and the, the Tammany conservatives were so freaked out, they shut off the gas lights and abandon the meeting. And there's this whole, you know, Birdsell tells this wonderful, captivating story of, of the throng of people crowding in and the fight for the chair. And it's a physical battle to get the Tammany people out. They don't have the numbers. They abandon the hall, turn off the lights. And the loco focos, uh, they weren't called that yet, but they go down to the basement. They break open boxes of candles. They light their matches. And there it is. That's the moment. Birdsell says, uh, let there be light. And there is light. And it's just this amazing moment. You can imagine with candle after candle lights. And, <laughs> and they make their radical nominations of anti-monopoly people. Um, they, they all you know, parade out through the streets of New York City. They give uh, loud huzzas and plaudits, uh, again, as Birdsell says. And, and they sort of melt away into the city, have their work having been accomplished. And the next day... The press, both Whig and regular Jacksonian Democrat press, uh, come out and, and trash them mercilessly and call them all sorts of names from the Guy Fox of politics and agrarians and Fannie Wright men. Uh, and they say the Loco Foco party because they lit their – they had to light their convention with candles. You know, It was sort of a, a term of derision. But of course uh, – uh, our radicals took it as a badge of honor, and that's that's how the the movement was born. Officially, they were called the Equal Rights Party. Now, when it was it an actual split with the Democratic Party? They tried to take over the Democratic Party. They weren't very successful. Yeah, for <laughs> for a few months there, there was some question as to whether we should, you know, still operate within the regular Democratic Party and just try to to force Tammany from within. Uh, now that we've made sort of a show. But, but they had to actually prove their strength politically first. So they set up this, this separate uh, – they, they waited a couple of months to see would, would Tammany, uh, when the election came around, would they uh, actually elect people who were loco-foco friendly, and they did not. And so they set up this, this separate organization, the Equal Rights Party. They nominated their own candidates, and over the next two years, they showed uh, that they really did control the balance of power. Now, they didn't win any elections outright on their own. They did win a few seats by joint nomination, which was a thing that third parties used to do, where they would pick candidates who ran for the Whigs or the Democrats who were friendly enough that they would jointly nominate the same person who was running for one of the major parties. Uh, and they won a few seats like that with the Whigs. And they were promptly betrayed. <laughs> Once the person got into office, they were pro bank, they were pro you know tariffs and internal improvements and and whatever else the Whigs wanted them to do. Um, but they they controlled the balance of power, so they won enough votes to force a Whig election. When clearly you know uh, it could have been a Democratic victory if if either Tammany had had come their way or vice versa. And and so by 1837. Van Buren is elected president, 
and he actually put a lot of the the loco foco radical economic program into practice. You know, he confronts the Panic of eighteen thirty seven and says, "Look, the problem is that government is too big," <laughs> which which sounds just wild to us today because this is, you know, as I think uh, Tom Woods once said, this is a period when. Most Amer- Americans never had an, an encounter with the federal government outside their local post office. There weren't tax agents, and you didn't, you know, the federal government was nowhere to be found for for most people, uh, unless you had to mail a letter. And 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 he said, still, it's because we're too big. Well, he was right, um, and it was things like the bank and and all sorts of other stuff, the government management of Western lands and things that caused the the bubble and the panic. And um, what part? He, what part? And with state banks, you said were quite influential and monopolistic, so they must have played a huge part in the uh, 1837 panic, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it, but it was also um, things like loco foco. Churchill C. Camberling was elected to Congress, and he was the he happened to be the one person. He's like the Justin Amash or or Thomas Massey of the crew, the one person who gets elected and actually stays true to his his original message. Uh, and he's out there making his first speech in Congress, I believe, his very first recorded speech at least. And he says, "Look, there's a massive bubble out there in the Western lands and and in our money markets." Uh, and we've had Mexican silver just flowing into America for a huge amount of time, and the Bank of England is investing in America, and you know all these foreign investors are are pouring money in here. That this is not sustainable because we've in, we've allowed it with uh, with artificial credit sources, and um, that speech triggers the Bank of England to withdraw a lot of their excess credit, and that's actually what prompts the Panic of 1837. Now. Um, it's unfortunate because the Loco Focos and the Equal Rights Party was made up mainly of working people, uh, working people and professionals like doctors, lawyers, uh, mechanics, or you know, sort of uh, advanced artisans of one kind or another, independent businessmen, grocery. Lots of people own grocery stores. Uh, there's there's one good study by Walter Hugens uh, that from the '60s, an early social history study that that actually breaks down the professions of these people, and th- they were very harmed by personally harmed by the Panic of 1837. In in the same ways that we you know during the coronavirus here we see average people being disproportionately harmed, and uh, so the the political movement, the independent movement of the Equal Rights Party, just evaporated under the the pressure of the Panic of 1837. And the twin pressure that Van Buren was actually putting a lot of their stuff into practice. He, he put William Leggett's idea for an independent treasury into law, which was that the, the government should stop holding all of its treasury in uh, state banks or private banks and the, the Bank of the United States or anything like it. We, the government should just hold its own treasury sort of in a, you know, like like kings of old in a big building. <laughs> and, and, and that way – all that government money isn't out there distorting credit markets in the banking system. And Van Buren did that. And it was a major radical advance. Uh, and, and that was clearly William Leggett's idea and, and from a, another guy named William Gouge. Um, and so, you know, it seemed to many of them that they, they won. They proved that they controlled the balance of power in, in New York uh, city and state politics. They proved that their policies could be effective with the Democratic president. And uh, they, a lot of them thought they won. And so most of them uh, went back to the Democratic Party in, in uh, late 1837. And Levi Slam, an important uh, editor in New York, was sort of the hatchet man who, who he was in charge of. He was party secretary after Fitzwilliam Birdsell. And uh, he decided not to call any new meetings, and so the party sort of slowly died. But it doesn't really stop there. You have some interesting thoughts on the cultural effects and also on the Door War, which I bet most people have never heard of either. Yeah, that's the thing. Historians stop the story right there because, as I said before, they just simply – they don't care about these people. They don't understand them. And if they do start to understand them, they decide, oh, my god, these are my mortal enemies from this era – uh, I'm not going to look into them anymore. And, and they dropped the story there, I, I'm, I fear to say. Um, that's probably been the case with at least a few of them. Um, 
And so the, the normal historical narrative is by 1837, the Locofoco movement neatly rewraps itself up with the Democratic Party and uh, disappears. And that's simply not true. For, for one thing, these, you know, this generation doesn't die. They don't like they're not raptured off the face of the earth. So, you know, they, they live on. And they continue affecting events. Their ideas live on. Walt Whitman, actually, uh, who was a young writer and editor himself at the time, before he became a famous poet, declared this was the age of Leggett. And uh, it, so profound was their real impact. With, within a few years of Leggett's death, he, d he died in, uh, I think, 1839, very young, because he, he had chronic ill health and he had tuberculosis. Another, another sop that the Van Buren administration gave to the Locos was they appointed William Leggett as a diplomatic representative to uh, what was called the United States of Central America, a short-lived state there in, in revolutionary Central America. And uh, so he was supposed to go there both to help his his health and uh, just to, to give him, to kind of get him away <laughs> from domestic politics now that most people were falling in line, get him out of here for a while. And, uh, but he died before he could go. And, um, you know, but his ideas lived on. And within a few years, Tammany Hall actually put a bust of Leggett in, in the building on display. Um, and, you know, William Cullen Bryant memorialized him in verse, and he was talked about for decades after. His, his effect on people was profound. And um, we see loco focos of one description or another um, all over the country. People from, from a, a small town called Alberg, Vermont, which is on the northern boundary of Lake Champlain, where a paper was called The Loco Foco, all the way down to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, if you can believe it, because of their anti-slavery position. Uh, the, the future mayor of the city, a man named Perez Coleman, started a paper called The Loco Foco uh, around about 1840 and uh, as a campaign paper. And so, you know, the, their impact was wide all the way across the country. And they were involved in, in the Canadian rebellions against Great Britain from 1837 to 1839, including the election of a man named Abram D. Smith to an office called the President of the Republic of Canada. And now these were just a bunch of drunken American Yahoo rowdies invading British Canada, and there wasn't much support for that, truth be told, and they were kind of a failure. But, but this was a major... Um, one of the major events in Canadian history, and it was it was directly inspired by locofocoism and radical Jacksonian ideas of anti-monopoly. Um, and as you mentioned, the the Door War just a few years after that, 1842 in Rhode Island. There's this bizarre and and it, it's just a wonderful set of stories. This this very bizarre attempt to revolutionize the government of Rhode Island, which had not been changed one bit since uh, 1661, I believe, when King Charles II issued the the charter to the Roger Williams colony. And uh, uh, it, it, the state constitution had not changed a letter all the way up till 1842. It was the oldest existing constitution in the world at the time. Um, and the problem with it was that you needed land in order to vote. So by 1842, it's it's this epicenter of American industrialism. And, and most people at this point do not own land, not even most white men. And so it, it, some people start to argue. In fact, loco focos like Levi Slam in New York start to argue uh, that Rhode Island no longer qualifies as a republic, which is unconstitutional. We have to get, you know, the Constitution mandates that all states have a Republican form of government. In, in Rhode Island, uh, more than half of the citizens are excluded from voting. And so it's not a republic by, by any stretch of the imagination. And, and these radical uh, uh, Jacksonians, they actually start as Whigs. Thomas Wilson Dorr is a Whig in, in Rhode Island. But this is a state that's dominated by anti-Jackson people. They were anti-Jackson. Not because they love banks and tariffs and big government, but because uh, they thought Jackson was a Caesar, and and it was things like uh, like his his censorship of the mails uh, that inspired uh, Dorr toward his anti-Jacksonism as a young man. But Dorr also read William Leggett, and uh, he read Locofocoism from New York, and he was a longtime activist to change the Constitution in Rhode Island. And um, 
eventually he realized that state politics was so dominated by the Whig Party uh, and they were so committed to maintaining the old charter for the state that he would have to jump ship and change to the Democratic Party to get anything done. And so that's what he does. And and he sort of hijacks the state party for a while and makes the the cause of uh, that organization um, uh, changing the government of Rhode Island. And uh, the, the Rhode Island voters are stubbornly against that. They don't want to change that. Why would they? It would dilute their power. And um, he produces this movement that is able to cobble together a majority of white male Rhode Islanders, and he puts together this spontaneous event called the People's uh, Convention in late 1841, and they write the People's Constitution. <laughs> and it calls for elections in 1842 for the people's government. And they elect the people's governor, Thomas Wilson Dorr, to, to be their governor. It's, it's an unprecedented event since the American Revolution. Um, but they say, well, this is our absolute sovereign right as a majority of the people. And they do indeed get a majority of the vote. What's more, they get a majority of the landholding vote in Rhode Island. So even by the old government standards, they have a majority. And so they say, look, this is now the sovereign legitimate government of Rhode Island. And of course, the old government refuses to give way. The national government under slaveholder John Tyler – refuses to get involved. And so you have this standoff by May of 1842 where there are two dueling governments operating in Rhode Island, one based on these radical locofoco principles and one based on essentially old world government by monarchical charter of, of rights and privileges given to you by the monarch as, as though that's how you get rights and, and powers, right, from, from some monarch. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly where you want to take the discussion from here, but this is a major, uh, event in the history of Rhode Island. It, it ends up producing a new constitution, uh, even though the Dorites are kind of ridiculously farcically unsuccessful. It's this. Oh, it's a strange Ter story. It is a it strange is, it, story. It should be a movie. Should it be a movie? <laughs> it, I, I, it should, but I'm not sure what genre it would be in. It certainly couldn't be. You couldn't make a Mel Gibson Patriot style movie out of this. No, because no. Because there are. I, I found in my research that there were these wonderful stories of essentially Doors Army was made up of young men from the villages who were trying to impress their girlfriends. And they wanted to make a show of their manliness, their bravado, standing up for their rights. And they ran at the first, uh, you know, fire from a musket, at the first sound of shot or the first look, you know, a flash of flame. They ran to the woods and they, literally his armies dissolved and everybody just scattered. So you couldn't make a, a, a patriot or a brave heart out of this. There, there's nothing to it like that. In fact. Uh, but but maybe it would be it would be well suited to our times because women ended up rising to the fore and taking control of the movement and making something really lasting and special and amazing out of it. Uh, Dorr forms up his army at at Providence and he 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 goes to he's gone to Washington he's gone to New York he's he's tried to like pitch his his uh, government to people in Washington, they don't want to hear it because it, it threatens slave regimes in the South. If you're arguing for, and D Dorr was a longtime anti-slavery guy, right? As were many of these people in Rhode Island, many of his allies. And and they say, look, if, if you institute universal manhood suffrage, that's going to turn a state like South Carolina and Mississippi, Louisiana, they will be black republics because that's a majority of the population. The male population, 55 percent in, in those states plus. Uh, so it would destroy the, the very foundation of, of southern government at the time, which was white supremacy. And 
they were not having it. There was no national coalition to be built, so there was no national support for this. They were on their own. Well, they Dorr had personal assurances from Locofocos, again, like Levi Slam, who you remember dissolved the original Equal Rights Party by not calling meetings. He was now an important influential editor uh, in New York City and uh, sort of the leading edge of, of Locofocoism at the time. Um, this movement, in fact, is what seems to have prompted Fitzwilliam Birdsell to go ahead and write his history of the movement. He writes it in 1842 during the course of all these events. Dorr has personal assurances from these people in New York that they will form up regiments to go join him in, in Rhode Island and conduct a civil war against the, the charter government or the Algerine government, as they called them. They called them Algerine in, in reference to the Day of Algiers, the you know, Muslim ruler in Algeria who uh, controlled Barbary, right? So the, the Barbary Wars, the Barbary Pirate Wars, like this, you know, famously tyrannical figures. Uh, they said this is the Algerine government of Rhode Island being tyrannical. They declared martial law. They were putting people in prison, all this stuff. Um, so Dorr is in New York. He gets promises from Loco Focos of regiments of thousands of people who are going to help him out. He goes with a few of them to Rhode Island half-cocked, not really ready for the contest. Uh, he forms up at the arsenal in Providence. He's going to try to take the, the state arsenal and all the munitions stored there. His own father and brother, staunch old-time Whigs, are actually inside the arsenal at the time. And Dorr is training cannons on the building with his father and brother, you know, peering out at him. Uh, and as I said, at the first sign of actual conflict, his army essentially evaporates. So the state militia shows up and his people disperse. And uh, he goes again to New York in, for asylum. He's there for a while. The governor of the charter regime in Rhode Island puts out requests that uh, neighboring governors deliver him up to them. Um, but Dora has so many supporters in New York City, they refuse the governor's order and say there's no way the governor can touch him. He's under our protection and all this. And and then convinced that he's got enough people to make a show and, and um, force some more national and state support. He, he goes back in the summer of 1842 to a place called Chapachet, another uh, state arsenal. And the exact same thing happens. His army disperses and he goes into hiding in, in uh, New Hampshire. And um, that's it. After that, most of his people are rounded up and put in prison. If they were involved in the Door government, they're they're put in prison, and that's when the women take over, and they they start these amazing events that just so again remind me of uh, the the good old Ron Paul campaign days, when we're all you know shacked up in a house campaigning together for a week. The great clam bakes. There we are. I was waiting for the clam bakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's a long story, but my God, I think it's it's uh, it's worth it because again, this kind of stuff this is never told. His, historians simply haven't done this kind of uh, work on what I take to be really the, these are the first libertarians. They're connecting all the ideas that we know of as the full package of libertarianism. And they're putting them into pretty astonishing revolutionary practice in places like Rhode Island. Now I should mention that I probably encountered the word locofoco in history as a pejorative. Uh, mm. Because in the late 19th century, it was a pejorative often used to describe any Democrat you didn't like. The Republicans, I think, used it a lot. Um, that, does that sound right to you? Yeah, and it is actually in this era that it becomes a catch-all word for Democrats. So for for a good uh, 20 years or so, I would say, from, from the early 1840s, you know, after most of the New Yorkers reabsorbed themselves in Van Buren's democracy – um, and the Democratic Party is an official thing with a national convention and all of that by 1840. Uh, Whigs start calling all Democrats loco focos. And so this is immediately where the record becomes very muddied and hard to distinguish. Who are the Leggettians, right? And who are the partisan hacks who are using this word to advance their own agenda? And it's precisely these years, it's actually this moment in the clam bakes, in the door war, and its aftermath, where that happens. And it's, it's because these women in Rhode Island, they are activists for 
the Rhode Island suffrage movement, which does not include women's suffrage at the time, but they clearly understand that this is a gateway toward their own equal rights, just as it is a gateway toward the slaves' equal rights and toward the foreigners' equal rights, the minority religious persons' equal rights, because a lot of these people were Quakers, they were spiritualists, they were atheists, they were you know minorities of, of all sorts of description. They were intersectional in that sense, and they knew it. And so one person's struggle for equality and liberty in the end equated to every person's struggle for equality and liberty. The women whose husbands are all imprisoned take up this movement's mantle and they turn it from the military uh, uh, way of changing things toward peaceful, political, and intellectual reform. Uh, they, they start holding these great um, clam bakes, these political fairs that included music and speeches and a, a grand feast uh, in the style of the Narragansett Indians who would um, – you, you, you basically dig a, a hole in the sand at the beach and um, you line it with seaweed. You fill that with rocks that you set on fire for a while and get them very hot, lots of coals. And, and you know, you, you get yourself a, a little uh, grill going. You line it again with more seaweed and corn husks and stuff like that. Fill it all with seafood of every description and potatoes and corn. Every, anybody who's had something like frogmore stew, it's exactly like that. Uh, you cover it all up and let it cook for a while, and then you have a big feast. And that, So that's what they did. They grafted this old Narragansett tradition onto this new Dorite suffragist loco foco political cause. And they, holded, they, they hosted these uh, fairs to raise relief funds for people in prison during the Dorr War and to spread the message as they saw it. And they, they were huge events that drew people from all over the, the area by steamer and um, by early train car and by stagecoach. And, you know, everybody's traveling into um, the uh, Narragansett Bay and to Boston and the different places that they hosted these. They held them just across the border in the bay, just across the Rhode Island border on the Massachusetts side within sight of Providence specifically so all the you know charter officials could see them doing this and it would you know they were they were really sticking it to the local press who was all whig and even if they were democrat they were fuddy duddy type conservatives and they were really sticking it to these people and they they even said things like they're not going to arrest a bunch of women and so we're going to do this and they're not going to come and mess with us and if they do we're going to stand up to them and the leader of this movement, a woman named Ann, Ann Parlin, um, papers reported that she talked of putting on pantaloons and going to join Dora's army, right? Like they wanted to to do absolutely everything they could, even if it meant she said she would lead the armies herself to death if necessary. And uh, they, the women shamed the men repeatedly for, for failing their end of this bargain. And now the women were going to take it up. And they, they did. They, these were huge events for years. And, and by 1844, you know, they, they go through the, the fall of 1842 and they sort of revive a little bit the next year. And by 1844, it's another campaign year. The Democratic Party has understood we need to take control of these events. And by 1844, the largest, the biggest Dorite clam bake of the era is at a place called Swampskit, Massachusetts. It draws a crowd of 25,000 people. Um, the largest park meeting ever recorded in New York was about the, the same time. It was a loco foco meeting of about 40,000 people. This drew 25,000 in, you know, rural Massachusetts. And, uh, and, and it was full of Dorite stuff, loco foco stuff, but who were they championing for president that year? James K. Polk, the man who ended up cooking up a war to steal half of Mexico, to extend slavery across the continent. He betrayed Northerners immediately. You know, they were all in favor of Manifest Destiny. Even our loco focos, they were wrapped up in Manifest Destiny, too. Uh, they thought America had this special historical mission, and it was, it was our job as radicals to make sure it turns out right. And, and they thought, hey, this guy Polk who wants to annex Texas and all of this, that's a good thing because what a triumph of republicanism 
for one country to peacefully absorb another and welcome it into a, a equal sisterhood of of states you know that to them seemed like an amazing thing and they vote for polk events like like this clam bake in the door war give him the margins necessary to become president 5000 votes in new york state alone would have made henry clay president it would have kept texas from being annexed it would have kept the southwest from being stolen from mexico but our loco focos again believed that th this was the guy who was known as the loco foco speaker of the house he's the guy who pushed through Van Buren's economic program years ago. He's got our backs. And he was a liar, a charlatan, and he betrayed them immediately and prosecuted a phony war for slave territory. He betrayed the Northerners' manifest destiny by bargaining with the British to split Oregon. And in those years, they, they realized, my God, we've been had. <laughs> we've made a huge, horrible mistake and they said we've got to change course and that's where these this, all this activism this energy this this anti-slavery anti-monopoly vision during you know Leggett's years in New York and the Door War and the Canadian rebellions all of this stuff eventually poured into what's called the Free Soil Party which is the foundation for the Republican Party and anti-slavery so it's quite a history and you don't hear about it much, so everybody should be reading your do doctoral dissertation. Ah, thank and, you. And then, <laughs> then the next step is for you to write the book. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. And uh, and <laughs> I, you see very few references to it, but I did see when Brian Doherty wrote about the Ron Paul Revolution in his book, he mentioned the Locofocos. Uh, he mentioned Ron Paul Revolution as the first kind of libertarian populist movement since the Locofocos, mm. which I think is about right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and part of that is because precisely in that election of 1844 and, and the you know, fallout of the Mexican War, a lot of them realized that democracy is actually pretty horrible. And it, it's not a good way to change society in a more uh, free direction. And uh, they feel like they get their chance. The, the, the hardcore anti-slavery locofocos realize they, they have their chance in 1860 with, with Lincoln. Um, and they take it. They, they say, look, the, the gamble is worth it. The sacrifice is worth it. Um, abolition is, is that important. It's but what do they something. think about the war? But, but that's it. They, they understand the whole way through that the majority is not their friend, and it never has been. The majority voters, politicians, th their interests are not toward greater liberty. They're, they're almost always toward this old government, this old world government drive toward power and privilege for you and yours. And, and that is antithetical, of course, to locofocalism and to our libertarianism. And so for generations after, say, the, the Civil War period, um, locofocalism just dis disappears. It, it really does uh, – melt into the either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party and it, it you know they have success with the Republicans and they have success with the Democrats and they push both parties toward uh, you know their philosophy in important ways and so they just kind of melt away and and slowly die and then for for generations after that the people who keep alive what we call libertarianism like Benjamin Tucker or Albert J Nock they are really profoundly anti-democratic and anti-populist. They understand that it produces things like slavery and civil wars, right? So it's it's always terror and a banking oligarchy to go along with it all and, you know, fund it all. And, and like they understand this kind of stuff so much better that the failure of locofocoism at heart was democracy. Much as they believed in it, much as they loved it, as important as it was to, to the way that they conceived and, and, and gave libertarianism to us, historically speaking, that was the failure of it. They, they did not realize that democracy was fundamentally antithetical to republicanism or equal rights. Well, that was Dr. Anthony Comegna talking about the meaning of the word locofoco and the history of when Democrats were libertarian. Now... 
that would be the perfect place to stop a podcast. But as you know, podcasts and vlogs and so on tend to be a little um, flop-a-doodle on the end. And I'm going to put some flop-a-doodle stuff at the end. This is what uh, Anthony and I were talking about as uh, we were trying to sign off. You know, this is how it goes. People talk. I did give you your handle on Twitter, I believe. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> yes, you did. Do- at Dr. Loco Foco. So that's Absolutely. how people can find you, is at Dr. Loco Foco <laughs> on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Is there mm-hmm. another place they should look for you in particular? Well, we uh, when I worked at the Cato Institute a few years ago, we published tons of material on the Loco Foco movement. Oh, great stuff. Uh, my old podcast, Liberty Chronicles, which you can find on iTunes and other podcatchers, uh, that tells the the story essentially of my dissertation in podcast form, and it was so wonderful being able to make that. Uh, I'm very proud of the way it turned out. So if people want to hear the story bit by bit, um, episode by episode, I would say Liberty Chronicles is the best place to go. But there's tons of uh, material to read at libertarianism.org. So now we can conclude the sixth episode of the Locofoco Netcast. This podcast can be found at most podcatchers on SoundCloud at locofoco.net and the team at locofoco.us. Thank you.